The next speaker is Jody Stanislav on low carb diet and intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is what I do in between meals, like at least three, four times a day. I do this intermittent. <laughs> and low carb is what I do in between two pasta meals. I do the low carb intermittent fasting. We're missing the speaker. Let me start putting the slides on. And <clears throat> while we wait for the speaker, we can start snooping into the slides and see what's coming. No, because we skip one speaker. Maybe she was expecting. Yeah, she was thinking. Uh. Oh, you're up, <laughs> Jody. Okay. So um, one, uh, the reason I invited Jody to speak is um, I. She was. Uh, she's a naturopathic doctor that consults people, and again, in a new technology kind of way, where they can call in and she has patients from all over the world. And she had, um, she had, she had her patients on this cocktail or a form of this. Um, at the same time, I was telling people about it. So um, I was told about her and from some of her patients, and we had very similar ideas on what um, how to intervene. So. Uh, she flew all the way out from Idaho and Sun Valley uh, to be here with us, so I'm very thankful for that. And then she um, she also had a wonderful TEDx talk. So if you look up and uh, and Jody Stanislaw on uh, TEDx or Dr. Jody, it has a uh, I think over a million views right now, and it's talking about the impacts on. Um, sugar uh, or sugar has on on the body of diabetics and um, the other thing she may or may not tell you I think she probably will is that she has type 1 diabetes herself so she lives with this and so um, oh I, I just made a HIPAA violation <laughs> she'll tell you <laughs> I'm okay I would have signed anything okay well thank you thank you for thank you for inviting me to be here and uh, just to give you a little background, I, I was diagnosed in 1980, and I spent a week at Seattle Children's Hospital and actually had a really fun time that week because the Children's Hospital made it fun. I had cable on my bed, and nobody at, in 1980 had cable at home. It was a big deal. So, And my doctors would come in in costumes and, you know, clown noses, and, and that's when I decided I wanted to be a doctor because I had so much fun that week. And so... Um, I'm acutely aware of the needs of type 1 and how much they're not being, um, you know, really not being, getting the care that they need. And I remember feeling very lonely for many years. And um, I remember asking a lot of questions that I couldn't get answers to. And that was very frustrating to me. So luckily, I'm a very motivated person and a very bold person to experiment on myself. Um, I figured out how to adjust my dose very early on when we were told, as some patients still are told, they cannot adjust their dose on their own. And um, I learned how to exercise without having to eat before, which was absolutely life-changing. Uh, simply reduce your insulin on board, which took me over a decade to learn. Um, after ending up in an eating disorder rehab center and having to eat all the time when I was a teenage girl and wanted to be thinner, but every time I exercised, I had to eat, you know, and now I know how to exercise without having to eat anything and not worry about go low. So um, I have a very passionate personal story, obviously, that I bring to helping my patients. So um, I'm also, I love, I lived in Italy twice, I love to travel, I love to be adventurous, so I've never wanted to work for a hospital or have a boss, so I created my own business, and um, I do virtual consulting for type 1 diabetics all around the world. Um, so I just created an online virtual consulting practice, and patients find me through my TED Talk, or through videos, or things like that, my newsletter, 
and I help type ones um, via phone and Skype around the world. Okay, so to be honest, I don't even know how I came up with this. It's just from the years and years of working with patients and looking at trials and looking at studies and everything that I recommend to my newly diagnosed type ones or anybody that can show me they still have C-peptide, um, I started kind of just say, well, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And why don't you do this? And so Sonia's like, oh, you should present on that. I'm like, well, these are just ideas that I've had that I <laughs> share with my patients. I, I don't have any clinical trials um, to present. And these are just literally ideas that I've created into a protocol, if you will. And um, they're all pretty innocent. So I always tell my patients, you know, if you do these seven things, I think you might be able to preserve your beta cells. And I, I can't tell you to what degree, for how long, but it seems like, you know, anecdotally, I have, you know, one patient who found me within two weeks of diagnosis. He hasn't been on insulin for over six months. Um, you know, I have, but, you know, it'd be great to have a study that includes all of these things. But then, of course, you can't have a study when you have <laughs> multiple, multiple variables going on. Anyways, so is it possible? Beta cell preservation is not commonly discussed. Um, studies are lacking, like I said, but I use seven steps. The first one, um, as a holistic physician, I'm always helping my patients with all of these basic pillars because anybody that has any sort of chronic disease, or to be honest, all of my patients that I used to see before I specialized in type 1, every single person needs to work on these four. So to have a healthy body, you really, in my opinion, need these four things. And if any of these four are out of balance, you're not going to have optimal health. Um, and the beautiful thing is there are there is data that supports specifically why somebody who's wanting to preserve the beta cells should do these four things. So the first thing that I always recommend is eating low carb. Uh, the conventional wisdom or the conventional medicine today says eat whatever you want and dose to cover. And I have never seen that work. And um, sure, you can count your carbs and your, your insulin to carb ratio is 1 to 15 and you eat 45 carbs, you take three units. But it's really not that simple. Um, it, it is not that easy. Getting the perfect dose is definitely an art. Um, and also there's fast digesting carbs and there's slow digesting carbs and protein affects it and fat affects it. So this whole simplified just count your carbs and cover is just, it's just a disservice. Um, so clearly if they're gonna eat less carbs, they're gonna have a less chance of going high and high blood sugar levels create toxicity to the beta cells. And also, clearly, the other benefit of eating lower carb is, of course, you take smaller doses. And the smaller doses then reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. And, um, you know, so my patients get in, can have A1Cs in the fives, can, you know, A1C of a six. And a lot of doctors, it's very frustrating. My patients will come to me and they'll say that they've been reprimanded by their doctor because their A1C is too low because they're worried about hypoglycemia. But what they don't realize is when you're dosing for low carb, you greatly reduce your chance of lows because you're not giving yourself 10 units of insulin that you have to give after you eat pizza or something very high carb. So we do know that glucotoxicity, um, you know, that's the core reason for complications in diabetes. Um, and beta cells are especially affected. And I was actually writing a, a paper for a medical journal, and I said, you know, I really, you know, the goal is to keep your blood sugar level between 70 and 120 as much as possible. And the medical editor put a red line through that, and she goes, that's, I've never heard that, that's unrealistic. And I'll say, well, yes, I, I understand that it's, quote, unrealistic um, for most people, but that is the definition of normal glucose. So as soon as you're above 130, 140, you are not you do not have an A1C of a healthy non-diabetic individual. And so these are the numbers. An A1C of 5.6 um, equates to an average blood sugar level of 114, right? So um, anything yeah, above that, yeah, please mute your phones to anybody that's on Zoom. Uh, so glucotoxicity, of course, um, is going to damage beta cells. So yes, I can't even keep mine between 70, 120, 24 hours a day, um, but I do a pretty darn good job. My high alarm on my, on my CGM is set at 120, so I do take action anytime above 120. 
Um, exercise is one of my favorite things to use to bring the blood sugars down uh, because as long as you have insulin on board, you can use activity to make your insulin work faster. So that is also something that doesn't seem to be commonly shared. Um, I even had a patient who came to me once whose doctor gave them a graph that said, if you're 200, don't eat for 30 minutes. If you're 250, don't eat for an hour. If you're 300, don't eat for two hours. And I was like, where is the take some insulin and go on a brisk walk, right? Because your insulin can work faster. As if you're just sitting there waiting for the insulin to work, right? That's, that doesn't, you know. And there's all these timeline curves of this is how Novolog works or this is how Humalog works. Well, again, everybody is different. How insulin sensitive you are, how active you are, how active you are earlier in the day, right? That also affects it. So I always tell patients there's no absolutes in diabetes care. Um, I mean, you need to know all these ratios and instant carb ratios and timelines, but you can't depend on them as if they're, you know, carved in stone and that's how they go. So, yeah. so we need to avoid that glucotoxicity. Um, the mechanism, this is, I know there's a mix of, of the public in here and, and scientists. So I, uh, I, I put in some, some more science-based slides as well. So chronic oxidative stress obviously is um, an important mechanism. High glucose concentrations clearly um, cause oxidative stress. And then some proof, um, uh, the, the antiviral overexpression of antioxidant enzymes and exogenous treatment with antioxidants um, have been shown to have protective effects. So antioxidants are key, which also proves that the oxidative stress is, is a key problem. Um, this goes a little deeper, again, for you scientists in here. Uh, the metabolic lesion appears to be, um, to involve this post-transcriptional defect in PDX1, uh, messenger RNA maturation. And this is just saying that this PDX1 is uh, a critically important transcription factor for basically making insulin and it's absent in glucotoxic beta cells. Um, another piece to just prove the, the importance of PDX1 is that it's been shown to improve insulin promoter activity when transferred into the glucotoxic beta cells. So if you're, for those of you, one of my favorite questions when I'm learning about science is what's the mechanism? What's the mechanism? I, went, I always wanna know, I was talking to Barry last night, I was like, what's the mechanism? So here's a little mechanism for those of you that like that question as well. Okay, so treatment clearly is to go low carb. Eating low carb is the most important step for avoiding glucose toxicity. And then of course people ask me, you know, how do you define low carb? There's lots of different definitions. A lot of people will say below 120 grams a day, but I never say it that way because I don't want anybody to eat 120 grams in one sitting. Um, so basically, you know, keeping your low glycemic carbs also, right? Because we could be eating 30 grams of Skittles, which I wouldn't recommend, versus 30 grams of black beans, which would be a much more slower, you know, rise to the, to the glucose. So, um, and then this is just for those of you that, um, whoops, have um, access to my slides after the fact. These are just some studies um, that I got actually from Dr. Jake Kushner, who is a pediatric endo in Houston, um, one of the few that strongly supports low carb, which sadly I have to say one of the few. Okay. Um, also the whole gluten free thing. People ask me about this all the time. Uh, there's definitely studies that are mixed on this, but again, everything that I recommend is easy enough in my opinion and innocent enough. You know, I'm not asking anybody in these seven steps to um, do something crazy or risky. Um, so studies are mixed. Some suggest a gluten-free diet may preserve beta cell function and others have not. Um, there is one study I found in infants, the amount, timing, and mode of introduction have been shown to affect the diabetogenic potential of gluten. Gluten-free diet largely prevents diabetes in non-obese diabetic mice, while cereal that base diet promotes it. So again, I'm not willing to wait until everything I'm presenting has been, you know, proven in, in a 10 year study. So again, when I tell patients to eat low carb and avoid gluten, um, those seem like pretty innocent enough suggestions. Um, this is a really interesting piece of information that many of you might not know. Um, so gluten differs from other cereal proteins. Um, it's partly resistant to enzymatic processing which and enzymes, of course, break down proteins. So that means the gluten protein actually stays in the gut longer, resulting in continuous exposure to the intestinal immune system. 
So again, here's the mechanism question being answered. So there is evidence that the intestinal immune system plays a primary role in the pathogenesis of, of type 1. Um, the T cells are initially primed in the gut. Um, you can find the islet infiltrating T cells expressing gut-associated homing receptors. So our conclusion is that gluten may affect diabetes development by influencing proportional changes in immune cell population or by modifying the cytokine chemokine pattern towards inflammatory profile. So um, again, this is one of the reasons why I say, well, you know, if you're newly diagnosed, why don't you just cut back on that gluten <laughs> or avoid it? Um, number two is my second pillar of health, is of course, regular exercise. Um, there is this one study I found, study of 16 men who self-reported undertaking significant exercise, both at diagnosis and afterwards. Um, and their honeymoon was experienced of 33 months compared to the average honeymoon of six months. And that's very commonly heard, right? That, oh, the honeymoon will be over in a few months. And that is clearly not what I have seen when I have patients that follow my protocol. So resistance training specifically is very important because the more muscle mass you have, the more insulin sensitive you are. And of course, muscles uh, love to eat up glucose. And so one of the things I teach my patients is what's called delayed onset hypoglycemia. And delayed onset hypoglycemia is after a diabetic patient um, does some sort of intense um, weightlifting, uh, this also can happen after, let's say, even two plus hours of cardiovascular exercise, anything that is a, a heavy demand on the muscles, um, then they go to bed, right? And um, they go low, or they relax and they go low, even though they're, quote, sitting at that time. But the reason is because your muscles are one of the main uh, storage locations in your body for glycogen, of course. So after intense exercise, those muscles have to eat up all the glucose they can out of your bloodstream in order to restock their glycogen storage. And so delayed onset hypoglycemia, I actually, before I went to medical school, I worked for a pump company and I sold pumps for a few years. And I was trying to get a professional ice hockey player on, um, on an insulin pump so he could more easily turn, turn down his insulin before the game. And unfortunately, as I'm sure all of you with type 1 know, there's a lot of fighting involved to get some of these things improved, or I shouldn't say fighting, but sometimes just unnecessary delays. <laughs> and um, this patient died. So he played a serious ice hockey game that night and um, probably didn't eat enough because even if he was, you know, you think if you can go to bed at 150, you'll be fine. But a lot of patients aren't taught about this delayed onset hypoglycemia as the muscles are refueling their glycogen storage. And so um, anyways, the, the, the good side of this, though, is when you know how to modulate for those kind of activities, you're much more insulin sensitive because not only post intense exercise are your muscles wanting to eat up more glucose, but the more muscle, the more lean mass you have 24 hours a day, the more these muscles are eating up glucose 24 hours a day. So you can e easily decrease your basal and your mealtime doses when you have more muscle mass. So you just, your body wants to eat up more glucose and it doesn't need insulin to do that. So this is step number two. Step number three, again, another basic one, right? Quality sleep. So again, as a holistic physician, I'm always helping patients with just really taking care of their bodies overall. So poor sleep quality um, clearly can lead to all of these things as well as insulin resistance. And clearly, if we're trying to make the beta cell, insulin, blood sugar balancing system efficient, we don't want to do anything that would increase insulin resistance. Um, this is clearly seen even in one night of um, reduced quality or, or reduced hours of sleep, uh, it's very easy to see somebody's blood sugar level run higher the next day. So it is not something that needs to build up over time. One night of, of uh, reduced sleep quality can, in, can cause an increased need of insulin the next day. Uh, number four, again, this plays into just like the sleep. Uh, the lack of enough sleep is causing stress to the body. So, and this is an interesting study I found that one 15 minute session of relaxation causes rapid changes in gene expression that are linked to a whole array of biological pathways. And just one of those is insulin secretion. 
So these genes are affected positively by simply a 15 minute, in this study, a 15 minute relaxation session. Um, so I work with patients over a three month period of time. I have phone calls every week or every other week for three months. And I really play many, I wear many hats when I work with patients. Um, I really enjoy helping them reduce their stress, helping them in improve their diet, helping them improve their sleep. Because clearly, these are all things that are not, not new, right? We all know these. But the, the missing piece is how do you have the support to actually, you know, do these things in your life. So sometimes when I'm on the phone with patients, you know, if they're, act if they're pretty riled up when I'm talking to them, I will say, you know what, and I'll do this with them. I'll set my phone timer for two minutes. And I'll say, are you sitting down? And I said, great. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like to close your eyes and we're just going to sit here and we're just going to breathe for two minutes. And it's that quick to change your biology. So I love doing that with patients. So those are the four pillars. Uh, diet, exercise, sleep, and emotional health. So like I said, those I work, all, I work with all of my patients. Um, most, 99% of my patients are type 1 now. But every now and then people will come and, you know, can you help me with my skin problem or whatever. <laughs> so um, I was trained as a primary care physician, so I still like doing some primary care. So now we'll go to number 5, 6, and 7. So I've, we've already covered this <laughs> all day today. So vitamin D and omega-3, of course. And there is... <laughs> that's our, our, Zoom, our Zoom folks with dogs in the background. There's a few other studies. Um, again, mixed, niacinamide. Can you say that? It's a pretty small font. Sorry about that. But um, again, uh, vitamin D and omega-3 are essential. We've clearly covered that today. Um, niacinamide has some mixed research. Um, it's just a, um, a form of B3, water-soluble vitamin. Um, gymnema um, has some, um, some decent research um, to enhance endogenous insulin, possibly by regenerating or revitalizing of residual beta cells. And then also some green tea, which again is just a really high antioxidant, right? And I was talking earlier about how the glucotoxic beta cells uh, do better when... Um, that when they're treated with endogenous antioxidants. So we've also clearly uh, covered today how diabetes is an inflammatory condition and you know, antioxidants, um, they, the, the role they play, of course, is in reducing inflammation. So we've already covered that one quite well. Number six is improving gut health. Now this is something that we, as in the whole naturopathic field, um, like to talk a lot about and um, Again, when we go back to the slide earlier that I was talking about how those immune cells really get um, primed in the gut, um, it goes without say that if uh, your gut is not healthy, then it's very common that the immune system is affected. So this is a study that's showing that eating fruits and vegetables, which encourage gut bacteria to produce high levels of acetate or butyrate, improves the integrity of the gut lining, thus reduces uh, pro-inflammatory factors and promotes immune tolerance. Diets yielding high amounts of short-chain fatty acids, acetate, and butyrate provide a beneficial effect of the immune system and a protective effect against development of type 1. So uh, any time I'm working with somebody to improve their gut health, I, of course, put them on an anti-inflammatory diet, which is, um, you know, the first thing I always say is eat whole foods and eat low carb. Those are the two most important things. Um, and I work with my patients. I give them recipes and um, delicious low carb treats and, and things like that because I also don't want to deprive my patients. Um, but clearly, if somebody is newly diagnosed and they're eating the standard American diet, that is not going to support them in saving their beta cells. So definitely looking at gut health and improving the diet is, is really key. And number seven, so I am not an expert on intermittent fasting. I just want you to know this. <laughs> Sonia wanted me to include some data on intermittent fasting. Um, as Barry and I spoke last night, fasting in general has also been proven to have quite a lot of benefits um, to overall metabolic health. So I'll go into another slide, the next slide, um, some 
details on that, but just to give you some background that I found, which I thought was interesting, is um, not only is it fasting, but time, time of day as well. So the circadian rhythms, of course, time of day plays a major role in integrating metabolism, um, as well as hormonal secretions, physical coordination, and sleep. Circadian rhythms are set by exposure to light and dark, as well as feeding times, thus consuming energy outside the normal feeding times, such as late night eating, may disrupt your energy. So desynchronization of the circadian rhythms may increase risk of chronic disease, as seen in the risk, increased risk of cardiometabolic disease and cancer in shift workers. So that's a very well established, uh, um, it's very well established that shift workers are at higher rate of cardiovascular and, you know, because our body is really uh, evolved, right, with, you know, being active with light and dark, uh, or being active with light and, and sleeping with dark, eating during daytime hours, you know, and it wasn't until the invention of all this electricity that now, you know, we have this like 24 hour life cycle and it's not beneficial to the body. So the science, again, for those of you that, what's the mechanism? Insulin sensitivity decreases throughout the day and into the night. Um, due to growth hormone. And so this is quite fascinating. This is another point as to why I explain to my patients that your insulin to carb ratio is absolutely not enough to determine how much insulin you need for your meals. Um, not only do you have growth hormone coming on at night, but you also have cortisol coming on in the morning, right? So the same meal eat, eaten at breakfast will need a m higher dose of insulin than the same meal eaten at lunch, or same thing is true with dinner, because you have all these other hormones that are doing their 24-hour cycles affecting your, um, your insulin sensitivity. And one, uh, one of the things I love to work on with my patients is to make sure that they have um, you know, the best blood sugar level as they can through the night. You know, I love to have patients 85 or 90 as they sleep because now we have 33% of their day in range. And that is huge because now we only have two thirds left of their day to deal with um, to get their A1C in range. And if we can get a perfect blood sugar level as they sleep, that is, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And the problem is if people are eating really big dinners late at night, that insulin, as soon as they go to sleep, they're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm 150 before I go to bed, but I have three units of insulin on board. And they think that three units of insulin on board is going to reduce their 150. But number one, they haven't even finished fully digesting their food. So their blood sugar level is not on the way down. It's on the way up. And number three, within an hour of them falling asleep, that growth hormone kicks in. And so that three units can suddenly feel like it's nothing. And I have so many patients complaining to me that they're like, if I'm high at night, I can't go down. If, I'm, if my blood sugar level is elevated at night, I just won't come down. And this is the mechanism, not to mention that they're not even moving, right? That they're, <laughs> they're complete, they're sedentary, they're asleep, right? So if by chance I do have um, a late dinner, I always like to go on a walk after dinner because that obviously, anytime I'm high after I eat, I like to go on a walk because that just increases the insulin sensitivity and um, helps that whole blood sugar mechanism work more efficiently. Um, so here, my second point, as much as 75% of human growth hormone is released during sleep, and the majority just about one hour after falling asleep. And so meals consumed at night have a greater postprandial glucose and um, spike and need for insulin than content match meals during the day. This is the kind of data that I love sharing with my patients that I've absolutely never learned from any of my doctor's appointments. And I know the doctors here probably know 10 times more than the average doctor, but I'm talking to patients all around the world. And I have patients in China, I have patients in Europe, I have patients in Australia, and none of them feel like their doctor is giving them all this detailed information. And so I'm very passionate about getting my work out there to really empower patients to um, to have better blood sugar levels and thus a longer life. Um, so e even a single fasting interval can reduce basal concentrations of many metabolic biomarkers associated with chronic disease, such as insulin and glucose. So um, the study that I was looking at not only supports fasting to give the body a time of, you know, just metabolic and digestive rest, but it showed that the ideal time was like 10 to 6, because again, by it's better than, uh, I think it was comparing it to like 1 to 9, 1 p.m. to 9. You know, if, if, if you're going to do an 8-hour eating period or a 16-hour fast, um, actually more in the middle of the day shows even better metabolic results than an 8-hour 
intermittent fast, but yet later in the day. Um, and so it's hypothesized that time-restricted feeding that aligns with daytime eating leads to improved oscillations in circadian clock gene expression, uh, the reprogramming of molecular mechanisms of energy metabolism, and improved body weight regulation. So benefits, improved diversity of gut flora, reduced gut permeability, less systemic inflammation, less hunger, improved quality of sleep, and increased energy levels. So not only are we talking about fasting, but we're also saying that the data strongly suggests that timing of food intake is an important determinant of human health and disease risk. Um, and this was just, there was a whole bunch of buzz about this just a few months ago, or maybe it was early last year, that they, in mice, which is why I kind of say it with this tone, because it was in mice, uh, but a four-day fasting mimicking diet, I mean, who wants to fast for four days? I fasted for seven once, but that's another story. Um, showed generation of insulin producing beta cells. So, of course, in my previous slides, I didn't say that fasting will, you know, will um, regenerate your beta cells, but in mice, it showed that. So, the fasting mimicking diet was shown to restore insulin secretion and glucose homeostasis in both type 1 and two, type 2 diabetes mouse models. Okay. So this is another study that kind of um, hits home the whole, all the details of my presentation, that retention of beta cells does show benefit. Because of course we can just intuitively think, well yeah, I want to retain my beta cells. But this study shows that yes, these people with beta cells will have a lower A1C, less hypoglycemia, and reduced incidence of long-term complication. Thus, retention of even small amounts of endogenous beta cell function for as long as possible should therefore be a key therapeutic goal in type 1. And, you know, it's so funny. I've literally had patients recently tell me that their doctors have told them they want them to get out of the honeymoon as fast as possible because then their blood sugar levels will be more predictable because they were associating the honeymoon with being unpredictable. And I thought, well, why are they calling it the honeymoon then? <laughs> I think there's a reason it's called the honeymoon period, right? Blood sugar management is easier when you have a little bit of your endogenous insulin secretion helping you out. Um, so I just, I, I just, you know, I had to first talk this patient into why I wanted to help her preserve her beta cells because I had to explain to her that the honeymoon period, I mean, that's, it's not called the hell period. It's called the honeymoon period. And, um, I, I don't know where that doctor got that idea, but so uh, in summary, um, these are the these are the steps that I do, the seven steps um, to preserve beta cells. And I know that when we're talking about reducing stress and eating better and exercising, it you know these are things that really people need help applying. So I always say motivation is what gets you started, um, but habit is what keeps you going. And so that's why I work with patients in a minimum of three months because I really want to be there to support them, not only as their um, consultant, their type 1 diabetes consultant, but of course we all need help with establishing these habits. And so many of my patients say, well, if I was just stronger, I could do this myself. And I will always empower them and think, it's not about your weakness, it's that you're human. And every human works better with support. And I will prove that with professional athletes. I'll say, okay, well, find me an Olympic athlete or professional athlete that got to where they are without a coach. Are they weak people? No, they're smart because they're using this fact that we all work better when we have people to support us. You know, if, if the athlete has to get up at four to be at practice at five, if nobody's there at five, how likely is it that the four o'clock alarm bell is going to actually be, right? Um, be honored. So I, I, as a holistic physician, I don't want to just help somebody get their A1C low because I also work with patients that have a 5% A1C who are miserable and unhappy. And um, so I'm always looking at all these four pillars, right? Sleep, stress, diet, exercise. And then if they're motivated, um, do a little fasting, take some supplements and improve their gut health. So um, I have Lots of resources on my website. I make a, a, I have a little type 1 diabetes TV video that I make every Tuesday. It's on YouTube. It's on my website. And I have um, a free course, a free online course, videos and handouts, the three essentials of lowering your A1C. 
and I am available for uh, phone consultations. I normally do a free phone consult for patients to just make sure that we're a good fit. I want us to both feel positive and um, I have a membership program. I have, I have a lot of resources because truly now, last year I spent um, six months making a whole series of training videos because I really want my knowledge to get out to the world on a, on a grand scale. And so the best way to do that, of course, today is, is um, automated content. So I have videos and handouts and my goal is to get them into hospitals and research centers because I also think it's a very efficient way and cost effective way. Um, I have five and a half hours of short five minute videos that teach patients as well as healthcare professionals what I think is the most thorough training for how to live a healthy and long life with type 1. So um, please absolutely send me an email or go to my website and if you have any interest in learning more from me or if you have patients um, that you believe could benefit from working with me, I absolutely love it. It's my whole mission, it's my career, it's what I do, and um, I thank you all for your, for your attention. Great. I completely agree that you need motivation and a coach, like the 7 a.m. meeting with the dean, if the dean wouldn't be there, forget it that you get out of bed at five. That uh, great presentation. I thank you for the decision, um, like the thing about sleep and exercise. Um, as a as a pediatric endocrinologist, the sleep and exercise uh, portion is very important. Um, my only comment is, is as a pediatric endocrinologist, um, I'm seeing issues now with kids coming on extremely low carb diets, and it is affecting their growth. So they may have a very good A1C, but they're not growing well, and to the point that they're like really slowing down their growth concerningly. So I think it's important when we're talking about low carb diets, what population are we looking at? So in, in young children, they should not be on a, a very restrictive low carb diet because they need the carbs because of growth and brain development, things like that. And then the same thing with the gluten free. I mean, everybody should be getting a celiac screen when they're diagnosed and that should be followed up. And so definitely if they have celiac, they should definitely be on the gluten free. But if they don't have celiac, the young children should not be on a gluten-free diet. Um, so it's important they should be screened. That's standard of care. Everybody should be screened. And of course, if they have celiac, they should go on the gluten-free diet. Thank you for your comments. And I certainly am not a pediatric specialist. Um, it seems confusing, though, because there seems to be um, conflicting research about the low carb and the growth. There was that study that came out um, studying the type 1 grit community, I think it was. Um, but one of the things I do feel passionate about is when patients are told they need to eat carbs, if they eat them from Skittles, they'll feel like it's fine, right? Well, I have to have 50 carbs, and this bag of Skittles has 50 grams of carb, right? So I think the education of healthy carbs is, is really needs to be yeah, much more. That's, that's essential. It, you know, yeah. the healthy carbs is such a difference, and that, that's critical. Yeah. Yeah. And low glycemic index. Right, exactly. Yeah, all carbs. I mean, that word carb is just thrown out there all the time, and it just really bothers me because, I mean, I've literally had kids at diabetes camp just say, well, I have to have the carbs, and they, you know, they're adding the sugar to their meal to just hit some sort of carb limit that they've been given. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Jack. And thank you, Dr. Jody, wonderful. Uh, there's something else that uh, I'd like to add. So, of course, we need a tight control from um, uh, physicians uh, to see what's going on with the patients. But it would be ideal also for the patient to have the discipline to take note of all of what is going on with their body. And this should, be, should happen both at the patient level and uh, their physician, uh, those um, endocrinologists who follow them so that we could analyze the data in a scientific way. It, this is the only uh, small piece. Uh, it, it's a lot of discipline, it's a lot of uh, time and effort from the part of the patients and of uh, the doctors that follow them. But this would enable us to uh, really track the changes and see if they, um, any of these um, interventions truly make a difference. It and like I said, I, I, I must admit, I don't have a good tracking system. You know, my patients can work with me for three months and then I might not hear from them for a very long time. And um, 
But yeah. they, they have to understand that uh, th this will not only impact them, but it would impact all of the patients uh, in the future. So it's, uh, it's a big deal. I need a Sonia to, <laughs> to, to be my data tracker. <laughs> Yeah. But I think we'll that, have uh, to work on that I think that education and nutrition should become central since grade school and uh, even in the mothers when they're or the parents during pregnancy because it's, uh, we are so primitive in, in education when you say carb and protein and fat, but like we think carbs, as you were saying, like there are so much differences in uh, the omega six and omega three content even in milk or eggs depending how the cow or the chicken mm -hmm. were fed or grown uh, and now nowadays to go to the grocery store uh, is like a, going in a minefield you know you, you really need to have an education we'll soon have the telephone scanning and google search is this safe not safe what is the oxytetracycline content in a processed meat with that are mechanically processed because maybe the chicken received tetracycline that are good for the chicken to grow without infection until they're slaughtered but then when the tetracycline goes to the bone become oxytetracycline which is cytotoxic and incidentally the most cell uh, hit is beta cells so it's a, you see this epidemic of diabetes in cats and dogs and in pets that are related to this feeding of the, the, the owner see chicken feeding <coughs> nuggets uh, and they think it's healthy because it's chicken and instead they're giving oxytetracycline to the dog. So it's like a, we're beginning to look at this into also Publix and other stores to see what is in every time you don't see the piece of meat with the bone like chicken nuggets, chicken fingers cotlet, Viennese cotlet, everything that is already prepared likely is made with mechanically processed meats. And uh, that carbs and uh, low glycemic index is a very good start, but it's a very complex. So I think uh, education, like the initiative like the academic teaching kitchens, that is also the way you cook, not just what you select, but uh, I think is, uh, you cannot be in a healthcare system and not have a human nutrition course and it should start very early in, in the educational path. Yeah. As, a mother, as a mother of a T1D, I can't agree with both of you more because I think, in my opinion, people don't give children enough credit. They understand more than, than we think they do when it comes to basic nutrition. And I think if we we teach them nutrition at an early age, then we've got most of the battle solved. But my challenge has been personally, I'm sorry this is personal, but that it's very hard to get a good nutritionist. It's very hard to get that education for your child. I really appreciate your input. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I really honor you for, for speaking up, and, and it is a very touchy subject. Um, diabetes, I mean, any, any child growing up in today's world, this what's a healthy diet is definitely confusing for everybody. And then it's a whole another level when it's, you have diabetes, right? So I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up on the exchange diet, and I had to weigh and measure everything, and, and I ended up in an eating disorder rehab center in my 20s for a few months. Um, so I, I personally very much relate to, you know, food crazy thinking. And one of the things that I like to do when I work with families is, first of all, say that this is motivation for everybody in the family to eat healthier. Um, the last thing I want is the diabetic kid to eat this way and everybody else to eat another way. And I think the best way that we teach the kids how to eat well is that it's modeled throughout the whole family, right? Um, modeling is much more powerful a teacher than, than verbally teaching, right? So um, I recently was talking to a mom who was struggling with her teenage daughter snacking on all these high-carb foods. And I literally asked the mom, I said, well, who's, who's buying them? And she said, I am. And I said, well, why are you buying them? And she's like, well, my other daughter wants them. 
you know, and I just was heartbroken because we can use diabetes to motivate everybody to eat healthier. What I teach patients is we need to eat more whole food, less processed food, and um, lower carb, which is already pretty much achieved when you just eat real food. You know, you have more fruits and vegetables and nuts and healthy proteins in the house. Um, and I really think that it, it's an um, opportunity to empower the whole family to eat healthy. And I don't like making nutrition so complicated. Um, I simply say, well, if you simply start with eating more whole food, real food, food that you can imagine growing from the earth in the way, in the form that you're looking at it, let's just make it simple. Yeah. But then again, how the eggs are raised and the chickens are raised, that's a whole other level. But <laughs> if we can get the, the Fruit Loops and the chips and the, you know, all the crackers and the cookies out and the ice cream out and the popsicles and the fruit chews and all that, so, you know, that's a good start. I, I was mentioning the chicken and the eggs because I have a friend that has this Principe di Fino in Italy that they, they raise uh, chicken in, that are running around these incredible fields because they have an amazing land. But was explaining to me, and then I checked yesterday when I went to the supermarket, that when you see organic, free-range chicken, organic, it means that it can mean that they just have a space to go outside. outside. And feed, but the, the problem is that uh, if chicken are raised inside, they tend never to go outside again. Mm -hmm. It would be like having a jail and then in 20 minutes walk around. But there you go to walk around. If you if it's a voluntary thing, they become lazy and tend to stay inside. But there are so many th uh, things that are going on, on labeling things on food that in reality you think you're buying something healthy, and, and then when you dig into the details, yeah. it's not so... But not some so are as, as confusing as that. There can be more clear ones, right? So, like Fruit Loops. Get it out. <laughs> or Oreo cookie, when they said the new Oreo cookie, one-third less calorie, and then you read the back, and it says the portion size goes from three cookies yeah. to two. <laughs> <laughs> With exactly yeah. the same okay. thing. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs>